Good morning students. Today we are going to discuss Gross Anatomy of Uterus part 1st. Learning objectives for my today's class are at the end of this session students should be able to describe location, position, borders and surfaces of uterus. They should be able to enumerate and describe parts of uterus and their relation with surrounding structures. Describe vasculature, lymphaticus and innervation of the uterus. Enumerate supports of uterus. Applied anatomy of uterus will be also discussed in this session. Uterus is a thick hollow muscular organ adapted for development of fertilized ome. It is regarded as central organ of female genitalia, normally situated in lesser pelvis between bladder in front and rectum behind. If we take a sagittal section of female pelvis, from anterior to posterior, the structures are anteriorly posterior to the symphysis pubis is urinary bladder, posteriorly located in the pelvis is rectum. Between these two structures lies uterus. The parts of uterus are, uterus is divided into two main regions. The body of the uterus, also called corpus uteri, forms the upper two-thirds of uterus and the cervix, cervicus uteri forms the lower third. As shown in this diagram, upper two-third is formed by the body of uterus and the lower one-third is formed by cervix. The parts of the uterus are fundus, body, and cervix. Shape and size. Uterus is a pear-shaped organ with the broad end, the body superiorly, and a narrow end, the cervix directed inferiorly, and contains a lumen that is flattened anterior-posteriorly, as shown in this section. Size of an adult non-gravid uterus. Its length is 7.5 cm, breadth 5 cm, thickness or anterior posterior diameter is 2.5 cm. It weighs between 30 and 40 grams in adult female. During pregnancy size of a uterus increases about 10 times. Fundus is the free rounded upper part of the uterus distal to the opening of the uterine tube. Body of the uterus lies between the fundus superiorly and cervix inferiorly. Cervix is defined as the narrow cylindrical part between internal and external pores. Body of the uterus is also called corpus uteri. It extends from the fundus at its uppermost part to the cervix or internal os inferiorly. Near its upper end, the body receives uterine tubes on both sides. The point of fusion between the uterine tube and body is called uterine corno. The fundus is superior to the entry pointers of the uterine tube and the uterine body narrows as it extends towards the cervix. Now, what are the various structures attached to the corno of the uterus? Arrangement of these structures is important because it helps us in side determination of a wet specimen in the dissection hall where most of the students get confused. The arrangement of structures in a wet specimen is in the middle lies the uterine tube. Posterior inferior to the uterine tube is ligament of ovary and anterior inferior to the uterine tube is round ligament of uterus. So this arrangement helps us in the inside determination of the uterus and keeping it in normal anatomical position where most of the students get confused. The confusion lies in the fact that in the living uterus lies in antiverted and antiflexed position. So in most of the textbooks, the relation of these structures is described as ovarian ligament posterior superior, uterine tube in the middle, and round ligament of the uterus anterior inferiorly. When we give a wet specimen to a student in the dissection hall for determination of side, he gets confused because in the wet specimen, uterus has two borders, two surfaces, anterior and posterior surfaces, in contrast to living, where the surfaces of the uterus are anterior inferior and posterior superior, changing the nomenclature of the structures at the corner of the uterus. In this diagram, uterus is shown in antiverted and antiflexed position. So the arrangement of the structures is round ligament lies anterior inferiorly, uterine tube lies in the middle, and ovarian ligament lies posterior superiorly. I again stress that students should not get confused with the arrangement of these structures in the living. In 
in a wet specimen in dissection hall. Fundus of the uterus. The dome-like fundus is covered by peritoneum, which is continuous with that of the neighboring surfaces. The latter margins or borders are convex, and on each side, the peritoneum is reflected laterally to form broad ligament, which extends as a flat sheet to the pelvic wall. So in this diagram, this is basically a posterior view of the uterus. The various structures attached to the lateral borders of the uterus have been shown. This red arrow, which is attached to the lateral border of the uterus, represents mesometrium or broad ligament of the uterus, which is basically a double layered fold of the peritoneum, extends from the lateral borders of the uterus towards the pelvic wall. It has, in fact, it has an anterior and posterior layer. In between the two layers lies the uterus and its associated structures. It is fixed inferiorly, whereas superiorly it is free to enclose to enclose the fallopian tube between anterior and posterior layers. Also shown in this picture is mesoselfing, which is basically mesentery of the uterine tube derived from anterior and posterior layers of the broad ligament. Also shown is mesoovarium, which is mesentery of the ovary derived from the posterior layer of the broad ligament. Borders and surfaces of the uterus. Uterus has two lateral borders, right lateral border and left lateral border. Between these borders, there is anterior surface, also called anterior inferior surface in living state or also called vesical surface because it is related to the urinary bladder. Posterior surface in a wet specimen, but in living we called it as posterior superior surface it is also called the intestinal surface because locus of intestine rest on it. This surface forms the anterior boundary of pouch of Douglas. The red arrows represent the lateral borders of the uterus. The size of the uterus varies in normal and pathological condition. The commonest physiological condition in which the size of the uterus changes is pregnancy. Uterus normally being a pelvic organ, it lies in lesser pelvis, but during pregnancy it enlarges, leaves the true pelvic cavity by third month of pregnancy and enters the abdominal cavity where its position varies with the stage of gestation borders of the uterus. The two lateral borders of the uterus are right and left lateral border, anterior surface also called the anterior inferior or vesical surface in living, posterior surface also called posterior superior surface or intestinal surface as already described because in normal anatomical position uterus is antiverted and antifluxed. So the arrangement of the structures in antiverted and antifluxed uterus at the coronal is as shown in this diagram round ligament lies anterior inferiorly, uterine tube lies in the middle and ovarian ligament lies posterior superiorly. Cervix of uterus. Cervix forms lower one third of the uterus. It is narrow constructed part, narrow than body and is cylindrical in shape. It extends from internal os to external os. The lower portion of the cervix continues into the vagina. Cervix is lower one third of the uterus. It is regarded as constructed lower part of the uterus. It is narrower than the body and is cylindrical in shape. It extends from internal to the external os, the lower portion of the cervix continues into the vagina as shown by this diagram. The cervix is divided into vaginal and supravaginal parts. So the part of the cervix which lies in the vagina is called the vaginal part and the, and the part of cervix which lies above this line is called supravaginal part. The adult known pregnant cervix is 2.5 cm long. It is narrower and more cylindrical than the corpus is widest at its mid level and around in section. As shown in this diagram, we take the sections of the uterus at different levels. Body is in no, body in non-pregnant state is in the has a cavity which is flattened anterior posteriorly. It has anterior posterior surface, but in case of vagina, the cavity is rounded in shape. The upper end of cervix communicates with body of the uterus via internal os and its lower end opens into the vagina at external os. The uterine tubes are attached to the upper part of the body of the uterus with their ostia opening into the lumen of uterine cavity. 
The adult non-pregnant uterus is 7.5 cm long, 5 cm compared to 2.5 cm in th thickness as already said and it weighs about 30 to 40 grams in non-pregnant state. External OS. In non-parous women, the external OS is usually a circular aperture, whereas after childbirth, it is in the form of a transverse fillet. There are two longitudinal ridges, one each on its anterior and posterior walls that give off small oblique palmate folds. These ascend laterally like the branches of a tree. This arrangement is called orbervite uteri. The folds on opposing walls interdigitate close the cervical canal. The narrow stomach forms the upper third of the cervix in non-pregnant uterus. Although unaffected in the first month of pregnancy, it is gradually taken up into the uterine body during second month to form the lower uterine segment, as shown in this diagram. In non-pregnant women, the stomach undergoes menstrual changes, although these are less marked than those in the body of the uterus, as shown in this diagram. Superior arrow represents the body of the uterus. During pregnancy, isthmus forms the lower uterine segment, whereas the rest of the cervix remains unaffected. Part of cervix. The external end of the cervix bulges into the anterior wall of the vagina, which divides it into supravaginal and vaginal parts. The supravaginal part of the cervix is separated in front from bladder by cellular connective tissue the parametrium, which also passes to the sides of the cervix and laterally between the two layers of the broad ligament. As shown in the simplified diagram, cervix is divided into supravaginal part which is related anterior to the urinary bladder and vaginal part which forms cornices of vagina. Supravaginal part which is related to the urinary bladder and vaginal part which forms vaginal cornices. Vesico uterine pouch. The anterior surface of the uterine body is covered by the peritoneum which is reflected onto the bladder at the uterovesical fold. This normally occurs at the level of internal os which is the most inferior margin of the body of uterus. Between the bladder and uterus there is vesico-uterine pouch which is obliterated when bladder is distended. As shown in this diagram, normally a vesico-uterine pouch lies between the peritoneum covering the anterior inferior surface of uterus and superior surface of the bladder. Since the position of the bladder and also the position of the uterus changes with the distension of the urinary bladder, this pouch normally contains loop subgut, but when the bladder is distended, this pouch may get obliterated as shown in this figure. When the bladder is empty, the vesico-uterine pouch is usually empty, but it may be occupied by part of the small intestine. Vesico-uterine pouch. The anterior surface of the uterine body is covered by peritoneum which is reflected onto the bladder at the uterovesical fold. This normally occurs at the level of the internal os which is the most inferior margin of the body of the uterus. Between the bladder and uterus there is vesico-uterine pouch which is obliterated when the bladder is distended. When the bladder is empty the vesico-uterine pouch is usually empty but may be occupied by parts of small intestine. When the bladder is empty, the vesico-uterine pouch is usually empty, but it may be occupied by parts of small intestine. Relation of the cervix is with the uterine arteries and ureter. This relation between the uterine arteries and ureter is very important surgically. The uterine arteries flank the cervix and the ureters descend forwards, serving under the arch formed by it about 2 cm from the cervix. Occasionally, this distance may be reduced to 0.5 cm. The relation of the arteries to the ureter is not always symmetrical. Less distance and asymmetry of the uterine arteries contributes to the urethral injuries caused during hysterectomy. As shown in this diagram, Superiorly, we have the uterine vessels which include uterine artery and vein. Below it, on either side of the lateral wall of the uterus is ureter passing anterior inferiorly to open into urinary bladder. What happens during hysterectomy? Hysterectomy is hysterectomy surgical removal of the uterus. The surgeon while ligating uterine artery also ligates or injures the ureter.
if the ureter is ligated due to the back flow of the if the ureter is like or cut this leads to the back flow of urine on that side after dilatation of the ureter which is called hydro ureter this dilatation of the renal pelvis followed by the dilatation of the renal calyces followed by the dilatation of major and minor calyces resulting in hydro ureter and hydro nephrosis as a, a result of dilatation of these structures the cortex of the kidney gets compressed leading to impairment of the renal functions and if not intervented surgically this may lead to the atrophy of the renal cortex resulting in permanent damage to the kidney on the affected side relations of cervical with uterine arteries have been shown in this diagram the uterine arteries flank the cervix and ureters descend forwards curving under the arch formed by it about 0.2 cm from as shown in this diagram relation of cervix with uterine arteries and ureter can be made is made very simple by these diagram in this this is basically the sagittal section of the pelvis in this you can see the ureter descend in the parametrium to enter urinary blood in this diagram we can see the relation of the ureter with the uterine arteries and the vein it passes below the uterine artery and the vein to enter the pelvis and is related to the lateral wall of the cervix in in this diagram you can see the relation of the ureter and uterine artery ureter passes below the uterine artery to enter the urinary bladder consequences of injury to the ureter injury to the ureter due to ligature retention of the urine dilatation of renal pelvis and calyces cortical atrophy impaired renal function hydronephrosis is the swelling of the kidney due to the build up urine it happens when the urine cannot drain out from the kidney to the bladder from a blockage or obstruction hydronephrosis can occur in one or both kidneys vaginal phonesis the vaginal part of the cervix is projected into vaginal cavity forming grooves around its perimeter termed as vaginal phonesis there are two lateral phonesis as shown by these arrows one anterior and one posterior fornix formation of these phonesis can be appreciated if we put one tube inside another tube so between the perimeter of the tube which lies inside and the walls of the outer tube anteriorly there is anterior fornix posteriorly there is posterior fornix and on each side we have two fornices called the lateral fornices important is our general fornices lateral fornix is important because it is used to stage malignancy of the cervix biopsy is taken from there for staging cervical malignancies posterior fornix is important because it is the deepest fornix of the vagina it has got medical legal importance a cervical smear is taken for post vital test this in case of sexual assault it is also used for caldocentesis and posterior colpartomy congenital malformations of the uterus failure in the fusion of the paramecium or mullerian duct results in uterus that is not pear shaped and has a varying degree of septation the most extreme example is often associated with septate vagina two services and two discrete uteri with one uterine tube this anomaly is called didelphine uterus as shown in this diagram sometimes there is just a septum or partial clifting of the uterus as shown so according to these conditions are called septate uterus or bicornuate uteri as shown in this figure relation of the uterus with the surrounding structure as already said uterus is a pelvic organ it lies in the lesser pelvis anterior to the uterus is urinary bladder bladder and the uterovesical space are anterior to the uterus the rectum and the recto uterine pouch are posterior to the uterus the broad ligaments are lateral to the uterus positions of the uterus are very important a non pregnant uterus lies within the pelvis it is position varies with distension of bladder and rectum except when displaced by much distended bladder the uterus is normally antiverted and antiflexed in position what is angle of antiversion and what is antiversion angle between long axis of the uterus and long axis of the vagina is called antiversion this angle is 90 degree antiflexion is the angle between 
angle of antiflexion is the angle between the body of the uterus and the cervix. This angle varies with the distension of the bladder and position of the body of the uterus and is between 120 to 170 degrees. Retroverted and retroflexed position. In 10 to 15 percent of the woman, the whole uterus leans forward at an angle to the vagina and is said to be retroverted. A uterus that angles backwards on the cervix is described as retroflexed. In this diagram, you can see the various positions of the uterus depending upon the distension of the bladder. So when the bladder is empty, uterus is antiverted and antiflexed. But when the bladder is full, uterus becomes retroverted and retroflexed in position. And between these two extreme positions, there are mid positions of the uterus, as shown by this green and blue images peritoneal relations of the uterus peritoneal relations of the uterus are important clinically they are also important for first year students where an examiner asks them for the site determination of the uterus and most of them get confused but if they know peritoneal reflections of the on the anterior and the posterior surface of the urinary bladder they can determine the site of the uterus as well as Keep it in normal anatomical position. Normally, fundus of the uterus is covered by peritoneum and is related related uterovesical pouch. The supravaginal cervix is not covered by the peritoneum and related to anterior one third of the superior surface of the urinary bladder. This is important for site determination of the uterus in case of wet specimen, where a student can identify the anterior surface of the uterus by seeing the peritoneal reflections. So anterior sur surface of the uterus is partially covered by the peritoneum. Posterior surface in case of wet specimen and posterior superior surface in case of living body, the entire posterior surface, fundus, body of the uterus and supravaginal cervix is covered by peritoneum and related pouch of Douglas. In the pouch separates uterus from rectum Relation is used for side determination. To make it simple, all of the posterior surface of the uterus is covered by the peritoneum. Thus, the students can differentiate between the anterior and the posterior surfaces of the uterus based on its peritoneal reflections. Lateral border of the uterus. Structures attached to the lateral borders of the uterus are broad ligaments attached to the lateral borders. It stretches from the lateral border to the floor and side walls of the pelvis. It consists of two layers, anterior and posterior layer, fixed inferiorly and free superiorly. In between the two layers lies connective tissue. Ovarian ligament, it connects ovary with lateral border of the uterus behind the fallopian tube, as shown in this diagram. Ovarian ligament also lies within the double layered fold of the peritoneum, called broad ligament. It connects ovary with lateral wall of the uterus. Round ligament stretches from lateral border of the uterus in front of the fallopian tube, passes through inguinal canal to the second of labia majora. So it lies anterior inferior to the uterine tube. Other structures related to lateral borders are uterine vessels, lymphaticus, hypophoron, paraphoron, ureters, uterine vessels and lymphaticus, the caudinal ligamentus stretches from the side of the cervix and vagina to the walls of the pelvis. They play an important role in maintaining uterus in position. The details of these structures will be covered in the part second of this lecture. Hypophoron and paraphoron as shown in this diagram are the vestigial structures derived from the mesonephric tubules. Posterior layer of the broad ligament is reflected backwards to form meso-ovarium. As shown in this diagram, as already said, meso-ovarium arises from the posterior layer of broad ligament. It encloses the ovary and forms its mesentery. Lateral borders, mesometrium, part of the broad ligament between the lateral borders and meso-ovarium, as shown by these three red dotted lines. Mesoselfing is part of the broad ligament between the fallopian tube and meso-ovarium. So it supports the fallopian tube. Basically, fallopian tube is enclosed between the two layers of the broad ligament, between anterior and the posterior layer. And these two layers are continuous with each other superiorly. From the posterior layer of this broad ligament, 
arises the meso ovarium which encloses the ovary suspensory part of the broad ligament between the infundibulum and lateral wall of the pelvis as shown by this red dotted line ovary is suspended from lateral wall of the pelvis by suspensory or infundibulo pelvic ligament it also carries blood vessels to the ovary if we take a sagittal section of the broad ligament we can see superiorly the uterine tube or also called a fallopian tube between the two layers of broad ligament which are continuous from the posterior layer of the broad ligament we have the ovarian it also encloses ovarian ligament and also the round ligament round ligament is enclosed by the anterior layer of the broad ligament whereas the ovarian ligament is enclosed by the posterior layer of the broad ligament between the anterior and the posterior layer of the broad ligament as shown in this figure lies the mesosalpingus from the posterior layer of the broad ligament a double layer fold encloses the ovary and is called meso ovarium fallopian tubes also called the uterine tubes they are attached to the upper end of the latter borders of the uterus the length of the fallopian tube is 10 cm and they are divided into four parts intramural part isthmus ampulla and infundibulum intramural part pierces the muscular wall of the uterus to open into the uterine cavity isthmus is narrow part where tubectomy is done ampulla is dilated part where fertilization occurs infundibulum is expanded funnel shaped part with four to five fimbri and in its bottom there is a lateral opening into the pelvic cavity one fimbri is attached to the ovary called as ovarian fimbri interior of the uterus uterine cavity is divided into cavity of the body and cervical canal cavity of the uterus is cleft like space triangular in outline in a longitudinal section at the upper lateral angle or opening is of the uterine tubes at the lower angle is opening of internal os interior of the cervical canal cervical canal is supendal shaped upper opening is called internal os lower opening is called external os between these two openings lies the cervical canal which is supendal shaped median longitudinal ridges are present in the anterior and the posterior walls there are transverse folds from their sides upper third of it in non pregnant uterus is called isthmus it undergoes menstrual changes and forms the lower uterine segment in pregnancy arterial supply of the uterus uterine artery arises from anterior division of internal iliac artery plays a dominant role even during pregnancy ovary another source of blood supply is from ovary and artery which arises from abdominal aorta below the renal artery it supplies ovary uterine tube and parts of the fundus uterine artery it originates from as already said it or genetics from anterior division of the iliac artery the uterine artery crosses ureter anteriorly in broad ligament before branching at the level of uterus one major branch ascends to the uterus tortuously within the broad ligament until it reaches the region of the ovarian hilum where it anastomoses with branches of the ovarian artery as shown in this figure the uterine artery gives a branch which ascends this branch supplies the uterus in addition to fallopian tube after reaching fallopian tube another blood source for the uterus is ovarian artery this ovarian artery forms an anastomosis with the branches of the uterine artery another branch from the uterine artery descends to supply the cervix and anastomosis with branches of the vaginal artery to form a median longitudinal vessel the azygous artery of vagina which descends anterior and posterior to the vagina as shown here the vaginal arteries are two branches from anterior division of internal iliac artery the descending branch from uterine artery supplies the vagina and forms the azygous arteries of vagina because of color coding these things become more clear in this diagram so uterine arteries which is the branch of internal iliac artery gives an ascending branch this ascending branch after supplying the uterine tube and anastomosis with the branch of ovarian artery so descending branch anastomosis with the branches of vaginal arteries and it forms it forms a zygous artery of the vagina one lies anteriorly and another and forms the zygous artery of the vagina distribution of the arteries within the wall of the uterus uterine arteries within the wall are also tortuous 
if we take a section of the uterine wall, each uterine artery gives of numerous branches. These enter the uterine wall, divide and run circumferentially as groups of anterior and posterior arcuate arteries. However, the left and right arterial trees and stomus across the midline and unilateral ligation can be performed without serious side effects. The arcuate artery supply many tortuous radial branches which pass centripetally through the deeper myometer layers, supplying these en route to reach the endometrium. If we take a section of the uterine artery, short straight vessels ending in the basal part of the endometrium, long spiral vessels reach innermost part of endometrium, spasm of these vessels results in ischemia and leads to menstruation. In this diagram it is shown that the uterine artery arising from anterior division of internal leg artery after re entering the wall of the uterus it gives red yellow branches from the red which run in the smooth muscle of the uterus these red, red from the radial branches we have straight branches which later on give spiral or coiled arteries these arteries enter the endometrium and it is the spasm of these vessels that results in menstrual bleeding venous drainage of uterus Venous follow the arteries. The venous drainage of the uterus is via the uterine venous, which extend laterally in the broad ligament and drain into the internal iliac vein. The uterine venous run a course adjacent to the arteries in the broad ligament and pass over the ureters just like the arteries. So both uterine artery and uterine venous pass over the ureter and ureter, ureter passes below them. The uterine venous fluxus and stomosis with the vaginal and ovarian venous fluxus. Lymphaticus from body of uterus. Lymphaticus always follow arteries. Vessels from the lower part of the uterine body pass mostly to the external iliac nodes. From the upper part of the body, the fundus and the uterine tubes, vessels accompany those of the those of ovaries to lateral aortic and pre-aortic nodes as the blood supply comes from ovarian artery, which is a branch from abdominal aorta below the level of renal arteries. So lymphaticus follow these vessels to reach para-aortic and pre-aortic group of lymph nodes. A few pass to the external iliac nodes. The region surrounding the isthmic part of the uterine tube is drained along the round ligament to superficial inguinal nodes. And this route of drainage is very important because at times malignancies from the angles of the uterus present in the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. Lymphaticus from the cervix. Collecting vessels from the cervix pass laterally in the parametrium to the external iliac nodes, posterior laterally to the internal iliac nodes, and posteriorly to the rectal and sacral nodes. Some cervical efferents may reach the obturator and gluteal nodes. Lymphatic drainage of the uterus can be summarized in this chart. Divide the uterus into the body and cervix. Body is further divided into fundus and body. Lymphatic drainage of uterus can be summarized in this diagram. So, lymphaticus of the uterus go to the three regions. Lymphaticus from the fundus, lymphaticus from the body, and lymphaticus from the cervix. From fundus, lymphaticus go to the pre- and para-aortic para group of nodes along ovarian vessels. From upper part of the body, lymphaticus from upper part of the body also drain into pre and periotic group of lymph nodes. And lymphaticus from the angles of the uterus go to the superficial inguinal nodes along round ligament. From lower part of the body, lymphaticus go to the external iliac group of lymph nodes along broad ligament. Lymphaticus from the cervix are further divided into lateral, posterior and posterior lateral groups. Lymphatic from the lateral part of the cervix go to the external iliac nodes, obturator nodes, paracervical nodes along parametrium. Lymphatic posterior part of the cervix go to sacral nodes along uterosacular. Lymphatic is from posterior part of the cervix is drained into sacral nodes along uterosacral ligament. So posterior, from posterior lateral part of the cervix, they drain to the internal iliac nodes. Innervation of the uterus. Uterovaginal plexus reaching along the uterine and the vaginal arteries. 
some cases are from the lower thoracic and L1 and L2 segments of the supinal cord. Parasympathetic thickness are from S2, 3, and 4 segments of supinal cord. Vein efferents are in sympathetic, so paravertebral block is applied in cancer of the uterus and liver penis. Some thick fibers cause uterine contraction and vasoconstriction, whereas parasympathetic nerves cause uterine inhibition and vasodilatation. Liver penis are due to vasoconstriction leading to ischemia. This pain is referred to T11 and T12 segments. Name various tortuous arteries in our body. Uterine arteries are already described. It is a tortuous artery. It is tortuous T is because of the fact that the size of the uterus increases 10 times during pregnancy. Another example of tortuous artery is supplenic artery. This is tortuous to facilitate movements of the supreme. Facial artery is another example of tortuous arteries of our body to facilitate movements of face. Gross anatomy of the uterus part 2 will be covered in the next, next session. Like, subscribe and share this video. Gross anatomy of uterus part 2 will be covered in the next session. Like, subscribe and share this video. Thank you for watching this video. Do not forget to subscribe my channel. Press on the bell icon to remain updated about more video uploads.